Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic of today's webinar is Massachusetts Municipal Utility Energy Storage Projects, examples from Sterling, Templeton, and Wakefield. This webinar is being presented by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. ASTAP is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Energy, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Clean Energy States Alliance. Our hosts for today's webinar are Todd Olinsky-Paul and Val Story. Todd and Val are project directors here at CESA, and we have a number of excellent guest speakers with us on the line. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees for today's webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can call in using a telephone or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to open or close your webinar control panel, you can use the little orange arrow that you see circled and that arrow also works to expand the control panel. One of the important things on your control panel, uh, your webinar console there to pay attention to is the questions box. So we do ask that you please submit your questions and your comments as you think of them by typing them into the question box and hitting send. We are gonna save 15 minutes or so at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. We've got a lot of people signed up today, so make sure that you type your question when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. We'll get to as many questions as we can. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email probably later this afternoon with a copy of the webinar recording and also a PDF of the slides. And you can also find those materials on CESA's website at cesa.org backslash webinars. And that is a good place to go also for information about upcoming webinars. So with that out of the way, I'm gonna pass it over to Todd and Val, who, as I said, are project directors here at the Clean Energy States Alliance. Thanks, Samantha. Welcome to the webinar. This is Todd Olinsky-Paul, and um, I'm going to say a few introductory words, and then I will be introducing Val Story, who will be hosting this webinar. So for those of you who are, Maybe joining us for the first time, Clean Energy States Alliance is a nonprofit. We're located in Vermont. We do a lot of work on clean energy uh, with state energy agencies all over the country. You can see many of them represented on this slide with their logos. Um, and we work in all kinds of uh, technologies, wind, solar, uh, renewable thermal, etc. cetera. Uh, this particular project, uh, the STAP project, focuses on energy storage. And Samantha, if you could just advance. Thank you. Um, so the STAP project is the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. Uh, it is uh, something that it's a project conducted by CESA under contract with Sandia National Laboratories. It's funded by US DOE Office of Electricity, and we're fortunate enough to have Emery Juk on the webinar today from US DOE. Um, basically, STAP conducts several key activities, including uh, informational webinars such as this one and other informational activities like uh, case studies, conference presentations, and so forth. Uh, we also work to facilitate public-private partnerships to support large-scale energy storage deployment projects, uh, and this in entails bringing state and municipal entities into collaborative uh, partnership with DOE and uh, the national labs to jointly support these large-scale energy storage deployments. You can look at the map here on the screen and see that we have uh, been involved in, in supporting projects all over the country. We also support state energy storage efforts uh, by providing technical and policy and program assistance. So for states that are interested in developing energy storage policies or programs or writing an energy storage roadmap, that sort of thing, uh, we do work with them. We help to <clears throat> provide technical assistance uh, both directly and uh, by engaging the national labs and DOE. So uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. 
that's that's the background on STAP. I wanted to, before I turn this over to Val, uh, I wanted to just try to put this, um, this webinar into perspective. Um, this webinar is focused on three municipal energy storage projects in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but this is just three of a much larger number. Uh, in fact, I compiled this list this morning. These are, and Sean Hamilton, who's on uh, as one of our panelists, may be able to add to this list. But, it, but to my knowledge, there are 10, uh, at least 10 municipal, uh, MLP, by the way, is, is a uh, acronym that's municipal um, light. Uh, this is the term they use in Massachusetts, but essentially a municipal utility, uh, at least 10 of them in Massachusetts are either have installed or in the process of developing energy storage projects. And really, uh, Sterling was the first and, and has been the model. Um, and so in terms of rep replicability, which is something that we, we strive for at STAP, uh, the DOE really uh, wants to see replicable projects. Uh, this project has has done uh, outstanding work in that regard. Um, I just uh, also want to mention that many of the projects listed here received grant funding through the Massachusetts ACES grant program, which is advancing uh, uh, Commonwealth Energy Storage. It was a grant program that we, along with uh, Sandia National Laboratories and DOE uh, helped the Massachusetts energy agencies to develop. And so we feel very uh, please, you know, uh, uh, proud and pleased to see that many of the grants um, to, awarded under the ACES program are now being, uh, in fact, uh, turning, turned into developed projects by uh, municipal and, and many other uh, types of entities in the state, including uh, businesses and um, cooperatives and so forth. So uh, with that little bit of context, um, I will turn the uh, remainder of the webinar over to Val's story. Uh, Val is a project director here at CESA. You may be familiar with her from some of the other work that she's done in er other areas such as wind energy and offshore wind and renewable thermal. Uh, she's done many webinars and uh, absolutely proficient and will do a fantastic job. And she will be introducing our speakers and uh, hosting the remainder of the webinar. So I'll turn this over to Val. Great, thanks Todd. And thanks to everyone for joining us. So as both Sam and Todd have mentioned, you have joined a webinar focusing on Massachusetts Municipal Utility Energy Storage Projects. In particular today, we're highlighting three projects, Sterling's, Templeton's and Wakefield's, and I'll introduce each of the speakers from those three areas before their presentations. But before we get started, a little more background on what the panelists will be discussing. I'm going to be talking about their, obviously, their energy storage systems. Um, some are in the pilot phase, some are demonstration projects, and they're going to be talking about the economic and resiliency benefits of these systems. And as Todd mentioned, Sterling is one of, is at the forefront of deploying energy storage and recently reached a milestone, which many of you may have heard about in the news, but Sterling recently announced that it's it has two energy storage systems combined with a community solar project and combined the two systems have saved the department over one million in avoided costs. That will be very interesting to hear about. I mean, before we get started with those presentations, I wanted to introduce Dr. Imre Zhuk, whom Todd gave you a little bit of an intro to, but Dr. Zhuk currently directs the Energy Storage Research Program at the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, from where he funds a wide variety of technologies and programs. So first we will talk to turn it over to Dr. Imre Zhuk to say a few introductory remarks. Well, hello. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Yes. Today we are celebrating, and I use the word advisedly, uh, the municipality of Sterling and also Templeton and Wakefield. 
And it also all started with the state of Massachusetts providing funding to further resilience projects in these towns. Well, we took a look at the, uh, the program and because we like to piggyback on uh, good projects like that, uh, we decided to, if you wish, adopt one of the towns, Sterling. And the first thing we said is, well, you really don't just want to do resilience. It's very nice to uh, be able to have backup for the police department, but uh, why don't you actually make the whole project pay for itself? So uh, the Office of Electricity, uh, through Sandia National Laboratory, provided some extra funding, as well as technical advice, and uh, helped with commissioning and generally getting the system going. Uh, but the main thing is we ran the whole project through the models at Sandia National Laboratory, and we showed how you can make money on the project. In fact, you can have a six and a half year payback uh, instead of just uh, providing uh, resiliency. So, um, we have the groundbreaking in October of 2016, and incredibly, three months later, uh, in December, we had the ribbon cutting. Uh, that is due to NEC who provided the storage and of course the uh, municipal uh, electricity and light department of Sterling. And this is something important. Whenever you do a project like that, you need a local champion. You need somebody who believes in the project and is capably seeing it through. And in this case, that was Sean Hamilton, uh, without whom this project would not have uh, been carried through. So uh, we ran it through the system and we found out that by using uh, monthly and yearly demand charges and a little bit of uh, frequency regulation, uh, we could have an actual payback in uh, a fairly short time. And indeed, uh, it worked out exactly as the model said. From the very first moment that the system was turned on, in December 2016, it started collecting uh, monthly uh, demand charges, uh, or it avoided monthly demand charges. And by March 2019, this amounted to a neat $1 million. And as a matter of fact, the project has become a bit famous. Visitors from Germany, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, England, Ireland, Australia, Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, Brazil, Chile, etc., etc., Thailand, uh, have visited the project and learned from it. We've also received the GTM Grid Edge Award, which is always a nice thing to have. Well, the project is now managed by uh, MWEC, uh, and more about that later. And this has really made it easier for the town to do all the balancing. It has also uh, made it much easier to for other towns in Massachusetts uh, to take advantage of the Sterling experience, uh, including the Sandia commissioning documents and the fact that they're all in the uh, New England ISO. So that much about Sterling and the other Massachusetts projects. But now I want to very briefly talk about a different business case. And that uh, leads me to a commissioning which we did uh, three weeks ago in Cordova, Alaska. The business case there is completely different. Obviously, they are not in, in, in New England ISO. Uh, in fact, they are fairly independent, 
uh, you can only get there by plane or boat. And so they are completely dependent on their run of the river hydropower of about 60 megawatts. Well, run of the river hydropower is difficult to dispatch. And so it was decided to introduce a one megawatt, one hour lithium ion battery uh, in order to uh, make the hydro more dispatchable. And they're going to be doing frequency regulation, replacing diesels, which are very expensive there. They were going to do load following uh, to make hydro dispatchable. And uh, they were going to provide emergency supply and uh, that means resiliency for the town because who knows when the next tsunami will come around or an earthquake. Uh, they do those things up there. So the system is installed and running. And again, we ran it through the modeling at Sandia National Laboratory. And uh, while it will not be as wildly successful as uh, Sterling, uh, it will nonetheless, uh, I think, break even in the long run. Now, DOE office and Office of Electricity uh, are looking for novel business cases. Novel could be either a new financial arrangement, it could be a new technology, a new chemistry, uh, it could be a new uh, renewable uh, energy that it's coupled with, uh, or in general, a new business case. But all of our projects have to have a new aspect from which we can learn and which will make the system replicable. Basically, we are de-risking storage for installation by new customers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Imre. That was a terrific national overview. Uh, spanning right across the country. Great to hear about this new project. So moving on to hearing more about the Sterling Municipal Light Department's project, we have Sean Hamilton. Sean Hamilton is the general manager of the Sterling Municipal Light Department, and he has almost 40 years of service in the public power industry. He began his career in 1979 as a lineman and advanced his current position. And during his career, he's been instrumental in bringing utility-scale renewable energy projects to municipal light departments. And now we will hear from Sean about one of those projects. Sean, and just as a reminder to folks, thank you. I see folks are typing in their questions. Keep them coming, and we're going to hold them till the end of the webinar, and then we'll bring all the panelists back to answer questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Sam, um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, Emery, thank you for the kind words. Uh, we've been very fortunate in this project to, to have the collaboration of the people that we work with. Um, the project's done very well, as you, as you mentioned earlier. I'm trying to get this slide to advance, stand by. There it is. Uh, there's the reason right there. This sits behind my head in my office. Um, we're an industry that you know, I've been in for almost 40 years, and um, the one thing I've noticed in the last five is the changes. You know, things have had to change. Solar's solar's grown, wind adaptation, um, and then batteries. Uh, we first started to look at batteries. It was primarily because we had so much solar, four and a half megawatts of solar on a 13 megawatt system. Um, we looked for something during the days like actually today in New England where it's raining, that we could store some of this and use it during higher price periods. Um, we started to look at batteries originally. Uh, the price was just cost prohibitive back in 2011, 2012. Uh, we were fortunate in later years in 2016 to work with the Mass DOER and um, DOE image team in Sandia to, to get this project. So um, I want to thank them again for, for, for their help they've given us in this project. Uh, I can't say thank you enough. Project, you can see it's very simple. Uh, most, that's the first thing most people say when they come to see this project is if you look at it, it's got the transformer far left, that's the transformer. Uh, middle middle item there is the inverter. Right to the right is the battery storage. That's two megawatts, 3.9 megawatt hour project. Uh, the HVAC units are located on the roof. Um, 
one thing about that, it's nine feet wide by 53 feet long, so it really doesn't take up a lot of room for, for what it's done for us. And i got to give credit to one of the crew members who suggested we move this off to the side. We were originally going to install this onto our bus bar, the end of one of our bus bars on a substation. I, I, to be honest with you, I think we were overthinking it a little bit. One of the crew members suggested, why not just build the circuit off to the side and, and run it that way? And that's, that's what we ended up doing. It's worked out fantastic. Another thing we did that's a little unique with this project is in the middle of the, um, the there, right next to the inverter, there's two transformers. You'll see the, uh, the small little transformer. That small transformer right there is to, to keep track of the actual uh, parasitic load. We wanted, we wanted to know and monitor what we thought that the air conditioners and lights and other things would use you know, to run this project. And um, it's kind of unique in the fact that we were only running it for uh, peak shaving and you know resiliency, of course. Um, but so there really was no footprints to follow because we don't know frequency regulation, anything like that. Uh, this is located not too far from the um, dispatch dispatch center, so we were able to go um, to put it next to that. But one one of the things we learned really quickly is, is how to build this project. And you know, and it gave a lot of credit to a lot of people, and that's exactly what it is. It, it's a collaboration of everyone. Um, you know, when you talk to your staff, get them on board, and the town officials. You know, everyone wants to know what's going on, what are you doing, why, what's the advantages, what's it cost, uh, all those questions. And these are people you see in the coffee shop, you see downtown, you see in the grocery store, that you know, and they want answers. So I think that was one of the things we did early is make sure that everyone in town was aware of what we were going to do, you know, during the permitting, you know, the, the fire the fire department. You've heard red lithium ion. Um, we met with the fire department very early to make sure that they were comfortable and see what they were looking at. And again, it was new to them. And we were one of the first, which didn't give them a lot of resources to reach out to. So they reached out across the country to different areas to see what they were doing. We talked to the building inspectors. We talked to the conservation commission. We talked to everyone to make sure everyone was comfortable because the last thing we wanted to do was put a project like this in place, have someone come along and you know, put a stopgap on this before we could get going. Um, I think one of the things we found along the way was, you know, not to be too rigid. Uh, when I say that, we usually start with a budget and here's your list of items you got to do, but you're bringing in communications. We had to bring in uh, a diff uh, different communications. Um, we brought in cameras for security. We brought in all kinds of things that weren't originally uh, thought of for the project, but as we went along, we, we really came, you know, adapted to what we needed to do. And um, again, resources, I can't say enough uh, to, to Dr. Jok and, and the DOE and, and Sandia, you know, to uh, Ray Byrne and um, Dan Borneo for the work they did, and CISA, you know, um, Clean Energy States Alliance, uh, Todd Alinsky, Paul, and the team up there have been, you know, great with, with us, helping us uh, get things going and introducing us to DOE. Uh, Mass DOER, that was Superstorm Sandy. They came out with that grant right after Superstorm Sandy. If you remember that, that was quite a uh, storm up the East Coast. And when the resiliency grant came out, you know, we looked at this and, and discussions with, again, with the fire and the police chief, um, we, we talked about the project and said, you know, and they said the same thing. Everybody needs a place to put their cell phones to get them charged. You know, that was then the main topic. And they also dispatched our police, fire, and uh, light department out of that building. So we thought if we could get them some type of a backup, uh, we'd all be in better shape. And, and that's how this thing worked out, worked out pretty well. You know, the other thing is, you know, Emwick. Uh, I can't say enough good things about Emwick. Uh, when you've got a team over there that's, that's you know, they're around the clock. They're, they're managing the Berkshire Wind Project, so they're, they're already into the market monitoring things, as well as the uh, Ludlow power plants. And um, they, this was new to them too. And working working with them with Steve Smith and Jason was also on this uh, webinar. And that team over there building this um, project and getting these things dispatched is it, incredible. They've, they've taken it over. They've done a phenomenal job, and I can't say enough good things about them. Um, we're very fortunate in that respect because it's things happen during the middle of the night when, when LMPs go negative or, or things happen, and to have someone, you know, full time watching this for you, feel very very fortunate about that. You know, the second the second project we did, it's it's a community first uh, project, work with the Regis Energy, um, and different style of battery, lithium ion. Also, this is a one megawatt. Uh, uh, one megawatt solar project that's actually located on top of one of our largest customers. So it's kind of, it really worked out nice. It was a win-win. Um, you know, we, it's on top of their roof. The batteries are down below. Uh, again, dispatchable. And it's on the same circuit as the other one, as the other uh, uh, critical facility that we want to monitor. So this also gave us additional um, firepower for that building if we ever need it in the future. 
Um, so it worked out very well. And we went out to the uh, uh, get subscription for that so for the community solar project. I mean, again, back to the staff and support. You know, the staff and, and the administrative staff and the office staff. I mean, two months they had 400 people signed up. We we sold out. Um, it says enough about the you know work they've done and how how great it was to have them on board and support the project. Uh, again, a lot of work. We sold the interconnect because that's what we do. We're a utility. We did a lot of the interconnect work and. Uh, and they just save some cost, and then we, we work from that point on. Now this is this is the project. This is a descript quick description of the uh, community solar project. It's 100% uh, with solar. We charge it every day that we can, or we can anticipate the storms or, or uh, overcast days and um, shift low cost power to the peak periods every day. We run it every day. Charge in the afternoon, mornings, and afternoons, and run every night um, for the ITC and also to keep the um, shift to keep the solar power. Um, residents, again, uh, you know, not everyone can put solar in their roof. It's those with the means are able to, and uh, there's also just the logistics that don't work. So this has allowed a lot of ratepayers to get involved. And because we had so many interested in, in limited power, we, we gave them all 25% of their energy needs that we guaranteed for 25 years. Um, so that, that, was a good, uh, that was a good project to, to, take, to work on. This kind of shows you the real uh, meat and potatoes of the project. This is this is the load shedding, the peak day, the ISO New England peak day back on June 13, 2017. You can see where we were sitting at right about uh, 2.30 or so, uh, up about 10.5, you know, 10.6. And you can see where we were um, at the peak period. We were down about 8.5, you know. So you can see that the work this battery does for us um, during these time periods, uh, we were able to shed that much load. and. Uh, Know, prevents different, you know, the dirtier generators from running. They don't need them right now. I think this also helps eventually on transmission costs. You know, we won't have to build so much transmission if we can look to control the distributed energy uh, better. Um, drawbacks, as you see, kind of need, you know, peaks are unpredictable. Uh, and, you know, uh, batteries are a finite source, so you got to spread it out a little bit. You know, 3.9 battery, we might spread out at 1.3 for three hours. If we're a little more confident, you know, we might split that in half. Um, in the peak, we used to we used to look to the solar to give us some type of benefit on the peak shaving. Um, that's disappearing. Uh, that that solar output's reduced during those days, and uh, the peak is later in the day. So later in the day, when solar's not at you know as um, good as it could be, that's the time we're running. We're seeing all our peaks starting to happen. And here's the future. You know, if you if you notice on this, there's no transmission, there's no nuclear, there's no anything. And this is a goal of some that are trying to get these things going, and I, I, if that's their goal, you know, batteries are going to have to be a part of it because there's, there's no way this can be accomplished without it. Um, and one of the reasons why, as you'll see on the next slide, you know, this is the end of 2017. We we're, you know, 60, 63% natural gas. Uh, we've got a ways to go. Um, it's a combination, and that, that's what that's what the batteries allow us to do. Uh, we can store that. We can store the wind. We can store the solar. Uh, we can shift things to you know when we need them. Uh, the intermittent resource kind of helps us uh, reel them in a little bit, but we still got a ways to go. And I, I think the batteries is one of the one of the key key ways to get there. This this is one slide that I show quite a bit. And if you look at the energy production on this day, um, it, it's our dependence on solar. This was this was a little overcast day, but it was a hot, humid day. And I think the humidity is what was really um, brought these numbers down. And you look at it, so it's a one megawatt system, but it's only putting out 137 kilo, 138 kilowatts. So you know, relying on relying on these solar during these periods, especially in the late afternoons when the uh, you know the overcast is really thick and, and the clouds are coming in. So we're able. To, that's I think that's what really one of the big things to be able to do with these batteries now. We're charging them in the morning when the sun's bright and clear, get the batteries filled, and then during the afternoon when this starts to happen later in the afternoon, um, we're, we're able to. Uh, you know, this is to use the batteries. You see right now that the um, this one is only at uh, 1:56 p.m., um, so it's in the middle of the you know, middle of the afternoon and, and not not very well for providing very much power for us. Um, it's not it's not a not an anti-solar thing. It's just a cautionary thing about solar. What it's what it's doing. This is this is kind of the one. When this was the original, going back to the original, when we talked to the DOER about um, getting the uh, when we applied for the grant, the original grant. And the reason being was, you know, right here you see that during the middle of the afternoon, two o'clock, 
we're, we're cruising along at about 10, 10 megawatts, and all of a sudden, you know, the thunderstorm rolls in, and we're, we're in a peaking period, looking at uh, two more megawatts to just kind of add on to our load, um, which is pretty expensive. And I think I'll show you the next slide down how expensive that becomes. Uh, many of you have probably seen this because it's in every presentation I do, because I think this is the one that really drives it home that during that period, if we have the batteries on, it goes the other way. And there's the price, owning green. So you're buying that power during that peak period. You know, you're not buying your pipe during that peak period at the top of that thing. You're buying that right here at 55 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, when you're selling it for 12 and a half, 13, it's, it's not a very good business model that you want to keep, you want to keep going with. This, this is some of the things to show you. Again, the solar, solar, uh, uh, without solar, um, what the profile, profile looks. And there's the, you know, uh, essential duck right there. Um, because you got the, the bottom there without solar available on the top without solar available. You can see that's just a straight line with solar. We can give back another two megawatts, two and a half megawatts. So it's, it makes a huge difference in our system, especially where we're not into the market for that top part, but rather we're, uh, Producing that inside sterling, or we're distributing inside sterling, no transmission cost or anything else. This is this is some of the things I just in the batteries and clear skies you can see on the, the gray line on the background there. That was the day before 319, 19 this year. Clear skies, battery sees full charge. And I guess one of the things the lessons learned is to is to watch the weather. We're trying to get a full charge into that thing. We've got to understand this is using the solar, of course. Um, we got to make sure that's going to be available the next day. So some days we're charging it and not discharging it much at night because we only save some for the next day. Um, well, that next day we only got a 72% charge because of the intermittent clouds. And, and even though the, I think the weather forecast was for another sunny day, but yeah, surprise, surprise, New England, the weather changed. But um, you know, it's more or less just to pay attention to the weather because it, it, it be, and this I think we're another point where MWEC comes in great. They're monitoring the weather, the loads, the ISO forecast. And they do a lot of things for us that we just just don't have the manpower to do. So I think that's been another critical thing that NWIC has done for us. You know, for those in New England, will remember this well. This is the uh, Central Mass, I should say. Um, this is the ice storm of 2008. Um, brutal. Uh, everything was down. I know that the town. I was not in Sterling during that time. Sterling had customers out for two weeks. Where I was, we had customers out to up to a week. You know, and I think in that time we did run into issues with the substation because your batteries actually drained during December trying to keep lights and things on your battery. So even when the power did come on, we had to use um, generators to jump the, the substation to get it going. So I, I look at something like this that batteries available um, because they were out for so long that this would have made a huge difference in within our, uh, within our, our um, power, turn the power back on quicker. But yeah, it was a nasty storm. It was. Uh, this is a little more about the resilience of benefits and, and what that the big one provides and, and the community solar storage project provides. But you know, 25 days we figured now between the two. Uh, it's located the main substation. You saw that picture. It's right across from the critical facility. Uh, that's where the um, solar one is, and the main one 2,300 feet. So we have a direct circuit there now that can go right to that thing. Um, separate circuit for both of them that works. It is microgrid capable with the solar. We'd have to jump start the solar with. Uh, Energy, of course, but uh, and we did do a live test in 2017, uh, which is kind of interesting. So when you tell the dispatchers and they've got all the lights in E911, we did work with Mass E911 and others to make sure um, we shut the power off, the generator turned on, we turned the batteries on, the uh, recognized the generator recognized the utility from the batteries, and then the battery the generator shut down. Then we actually had it running off of the um, batteries. Before we could do that, one, one thing we did discover during the testing phase was that most of your reclosers, although we were in discussion with them on what we were going to do with it, it came wired only looking one way. So that was a lesson learned during the test that the reclosers is going to be bi-directional to make sure it's wired that way. It's not just looking for the source at one end. Um, that was a lesson learned for us. Despite talking about it all the time, we just assumed everyone knew. So uh, that's, that's something to be aware of. Uh, there's another one that kind of shows, and Emory, Emory alluded to it earlier, uh, Dr. Joke, when he talked about, you know, we started on 10 12, we broke ground, and on December 16th, there was about a wind chill of 25 below that day. And, you know, the guys, the crew here started that project. We had a cookout, you know, we had a, a cookout, a ribbon cutting, and we got started. And that afternoon, they went up there and started working. Uh, this was actually 33 working days, much more days on the calendar, but 
Um, they work for they work ten hour days, four tens, and uh, total working days in this project for them was 33 from, from start to finish. And we did probably 90 percent of the interconnect and the uh, logistics there, the pads and, and the transformers and all that. We had to bring in some outside help to do a little bit of excavating, but other than that, um, the crew did most of the work. I think that speaks volumes to the type of type of team I have here and very fortunate to have because that's that's how you get things like this done. They wanted to pull the cables, they wanted to do the work, so very, very fortunate to have the team we have here. And the board support, I, I only have mentioned that, but you've got to bring to your, a project like this to your board to support it. And uh, again, I was very fortunate to have the board that I work with to, to support a project like this. Uh, this one I always put out there, this is a Barron's, this says enough. Barron, if Barron's is watching your batteries, you know there's money in it, because that's, that's what they do. They're, they're, that's a business it's a business magazine, and they pay attention. Um, and, you know, and this is also, you know, we're looking at not only just a business for us and, and, and load shedding and, and things like that, but it's also become a transmission asset. And there's quite a return in there. So financeability uh, is becoming, I'm sure it's coming much easier when those kind of numbers are, are coming in. A few more quick slides here. Uh, this was the one, uh, you know, talking about 1061 as a 61. That's actually just over um, over 1.1 uh, now. Um, 61. I didn't have the numbers for for May yet in there. Um, you can see below here that just captured 28 or 30 peaks, and and Emwick is 28 for 28. Um, the two peaks are, are 24 for 24. The two peaks that we missed were early on. We were changing our batteries and not recognizing or understanding the batteries. I should say. That they had to be uh, the batteries had to be aligned, uh, allowed to balance a little bit. Therefore, they didn't want us to run it while they're balancing. That was one that we missed on a peak. Uh, lesson learned there. And the second one was just just a normal day, just nothing. But just because nothing else happened that month, that happened to be the, the thing. So you can see, that, you know, the, the this is the value of where this the money comes from. And the bottom of that is, um, you know, Ray, Dr. Raven Burns uh, worked from Sandia on these working on this because. Um, we do a lot of energy arbitrage, which is a little lower because the market's been lower, and we don't do any frequency regulation. So, so the thing has not run a lot, uh, 134 times since, since we started this project. This is the cost right there. That's everything. There's nothing to hold back. We're public. There's nothing to uh, hide. That's, that's what we paid out for engineering, feasibility, inverter, and things. Um, I think there's some more, yeah, we did some optional substation communication, relay panel upgrades. Those are more for the system more than, than the batteries, but just while we we're there and had everyone engaged in the substation, we continued to do it. Uh, here's the avoided cost again. You can see what the, the green is the first one, the NEC cumulative and the Regis uh, battery coming in and, and where we are now, what's that done, what's that done, what that's done for us. And the visitors, uh, Emery, let's mention we we still have a tour a week, sometimes two. Uh, what, what's pretty interesting is the different countries that are coming here is to find out why they want them, what they what they're looking at the batteries for, because every one of them almost has a different reason. Some of them are, you know, stability, some uh, voltage stability, some of them are, you know, resiliency, some of them are just load shifting, you know, from one end of the island to the other. They want to be able to move something to keep up with the load. Um, and we've had a lot of you know municipals and and, and IOUs and others just seeing how it works and so we've been pretty fortunate to, and I think that's why we have so many tours you know it'd be easy to say no we're too busy but I think it's our way of giving back from the generosity of, of Dr. Joke and the, the DOER and um, others that you know, we, we've kind of adopted the theory that we'll give back to others and do these tours to, to give back a little bit for this project. Uh, the video if you haven't seen this video I, I recommend you see it. I'm not saying because it's about us it's about it's about a project that's been successful by a group of people, and, and it's one of our greatest customers is in there. She's 92 years old. You'll guarantee you'll fall in love with her. Um, it just it's shown around the world. Uh, I've heard a ton of people have seen it, and uh, it, it kind of drives home. And it's actually been used to educate legislators on how batteries work or what they're being used for and why. So I was kind of impressed to hear about that when, when someone told me they used it for that purpose. This shows, you know, just a, we were very fortunate for 533 watts. I think we are up to 810 watts per customer now. We were at 240 at 533. Uh, I don't know where that falls in the thing. There's so many projects because of every successful system that was so many projects now that we're, I don't know where we fall now, but that's okay. Um, again, here's the list of those uh, all through, even Sea Island Orchard at the bottom from SMUD um, reached out to their team really doing community solar to ask advice. And, and they, they sent me a team of engineers. What do we need from them? You know, so it's 
really worked out well with this this whole group of people that to, to be able to do a project like this. So yeah, that's um, that's what I've got. I've got one more slide here. Just kind of shows what tipped it off. You can see where we were in 2013. Why we looked at batteries, and then 2015 we're still there. So that that was the idea was to get the batteries to help with the solar. So well, thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was a great presentation. It seems like it takes a village to build a storage project. Um, before we let you go, I just wanted to ask one clarifying question. I think Dr. Zhuk mentioned that when they did the modeling, maybe it wasn't for this project, but it was a six and a half year payback period. What are you seeing now? What is the current projected payback period for the Sterling? Batteries. Yeah, it is a project, and it would be a full payback within 6.2 years without any grants. We are fully paid back already uh, with the grants we received from DOE and DOER, um, but without the grants, it'd be about you know, five, five, a little over five, five point two. I think would be a safer, safer number. But yeah, All we right. originally seven years, but we were fortunate to get two grants, which, which expedited the payback. Great, thank you. And you answered another one of the questions that came in. Well, as I mentioned, we'll get to the Q&A later. We'll move on to our second speaker for this afternoon. Our second speaker is Jason Viadero, and he will actually be presenting on the Templeton Municipal Light and Water Plants Energy Storage System. Unfortunately, John Driscoll, the general manager over there, can't didn't make it, but Jason is with MWEC, whom Sean mentioned in his presentation, the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company. And Jason is an engineer there, and he's the head of Emerging Technologies Group, which is dedicated to looking at new technologies, specifically in distributed energy resources and in load control. So I will pass it over to Jason, who will tell us more about the project and MWEC's relationship with the municipal departments. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, Val. Um, as Sean t said earlier, too, um, getting some of these projects off the ground really takes a champion uh, within the community. And I can't say enough about uh, the work that was done by John Driscoll, uh, as well as his commissioners, and then uh, Electric Superintendent Tom Berry, um, to really get the project off the ground in Templeton. Um, this was years of work coming. Um, so, so again, you know, to really get these things moving, we need uh, help locally. And he was a great proponent of this and great proponent of energy storage. Uh, so, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I work with MWIC, which is essentially a joint action agency uh, that represents 20 of the 40 municipal utilities uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, we were originally, you know, chartered it over four decades ago, uh, primarily providing wholesale generation services. So operation of fossil fuel uh, generation plants, uh, which morphed over the years into, you know, the creation of renewable projects, uh, Berkshire Wind, as Sean mentioned. Uh, and now in the last three years that I've been here, uh, really getting down into the distribution level. Um, and, you know, some of these distributed energy resources. Um, uh, so, so I want to talk a little bit about the Templeton Municipal Light and Water Department. Uh, the town of Templeton itself uh, is a rural municipal utility uh, located about 30 minutes north of Worcester near the New Hampshire state line. Uh, it's primarily residential customers, um, slightly under 4,000 customers served uh, with very few uh, large CNI. There's a large paper mill in town. Um, but overall, it's, it's primarily residential um, with a peak demand of about 11 megawatts. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, what we saw as a vulnerability, um, and John saw as a vulnerability, uh, with a single 69 kV interconnection to the rest of the grid. Um, so, so as Sean mentioned, you know, during 2008 under the ice storm, uh, as well as other adverse conditions, uh, if that line goes down, essentially the whole town goes dark. Uh, and, you know, until that can get restored, um, that presents a big problem. Uh, so the project uh, is basically a smaller version. It's a 40-foot uh, battery container uh, by NEC, uh, same provider as uh, both the Wakefield project, which will be discussed a little bit later, uh, as well as Sterling project a couple years earlier. Um, we opted for something a little bit smaller, and John opted for something a little bit smaller, uh, just really to try to shoehorn it into a small footprint, uh, and then also to try, to try to limit some of the costs associated with the project and keep it under $2 million. Um, the project's located at 86 Bridge Street, right next to the main offices for the light department, as well as adjacent to the substation. Um, and total cost for the project came in at about $1.6 million. 
uh, against a $1.7 million budget. Um, and, you know, the real big cost savings associated with this project um, were really some of the construction costs. The battery costs came in, you know, right where we expected to. Uh, but by having a flat, undeveloped, you know, area right next to a parking lot uh, and between that and the pole yard um, made construction incredibly simple and incredibly fast on this. Uh, I think from initial groundbreaking uh, to finally having this thing online, they were just over six weeks. Um, and, you know, that, that really added to the savings associated with the project. Um, the project itself is uh, lithium ion cells from NEC. It's warrantied for 10 years with a projected lifespan of about 15 years. Uh, the town of Templeton chose to finance about half the project cost uh, through MWIC's pooled loan program, and the rest came out of free capital. Um, but doing that, uh, we're looking at essentially a 5.3 year payback, um, you know, conservatively modeled. Uh, so hopefully we're going to be looking at less than five years in actuality. Uh, and the real big thing, and the thing that we at MWIC are trying to, you know, really prop up is the fact that this thing is uh, one of the first projects in Massachusetts done without any type of grant funding. Um, so the idea of trying to put energy storage project in Templeton uh, goes back to 2016. Um, it, it doesn't hurt that Sean uh, Hamilton is uh, a resident of Templeton. Um, so some of his advice and words of wisdom through the Sterling project really helped to try to get this off the ground and help get moving with the board. Um, it was originally planned for uh, capacity as well as transmission reduction, uh, as well as future microgrid potential, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, again, you know, talking about the vulnerabilities in a rural community with a single point of interconnection, uh, providing resiliency, particularly for underserved portions of the population. Um, while it's hard to quantify from a financial standpoint, uh, as a municipal utility, it's something that in good conscience we just want to try to do. Um, we went through a first round of uh, CCERI funding, which is critical care energy resource uh, infrastructure funding, which is a similar program to what Sean went through. Uh, initially wasn't awarded. We applied through the Mass ACES grants back in 2017 as well, uh, after that was not awarded. Uh, finally, though, we saw the cost of battery technology and lithium ion battery technology uh, continuing to decline rapidly. Um, so the general manager in Templeton, John, and his board made a decision in 2018 to say, look, you know, these things have come down significantly since just two years ago. Uh, the time is right, you know, with declining costs as well as increasing costs for transmission in New England. Uh, let's make a go of this and let's construct a battery. Um, we talked about resiliency uh, and future micrograding potential. Um, the 1303 circuit, which is one of four circuits coming out of the Templeton uh, Municipal Light Plants uh, substation, which is adjacent to where the battery is, uh, serves quite a few critical care facilities. There's a residential treatment facility, a nursing home, as well as a senior housing uh, facility, all within less than a mile uh, long stretch of that circuit. Um, so the decision was made to uh, basically install the battery on that 1303 circuit. So in the future, with any type of uh, additions of additional switching there, uh, it would be relatively easy to island this and provide you know, up to 24, potentially uh, 36 hours of backup power to these critical, uh, critical pieces of infrastructure uh, and really buy some time uh, you know, in the event of an ice storm or other type of natural disaster to get folks in there to get um, these people out to different facilities, you know, Gardner, Worcester, uh, where, where they're going to be better served uh, in the event of a power loss to the whole town. Um, so I talk about, you know, the declining cost of batteries, uh, why this project made sense. Um, since the inception, the lithium ion battery cell prices have continued to decline um, and decline quite rapidly. Um, you know, we look back at Sterling, which is constructed in 2016. Um, they, they got, I think, over $1.7 million in grant funding. Uh, Wakefield, uh, which we'll hear about next, as well as Ashburnham, uh, which were both funded partially under the Massachusetts ACES grant, got six hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars respectively. Um, Templeton got nothing, um, and I don't see that as a bad thing. I, I see that as a maturiza maturation of the technology, um, and that as providers overseas begin to ramp up production of these things for electric vehicles and other needs, uh, the costs continue to plummet. And we looked at here now an install cost of less than five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. Uh, which is, you know, over 25% less than the battery storage cost, installation costs alone uh, compared to Sterling. And then when you leverage that with some of the cost savings, because we weren't working in an energized substation, uh, we had a very level and flat um, surface to start on, uh, really helped drive down costs of the total project and made it economical. 
Um, and this project is, is the most recent one, at least uh, for the MWIC energy storage project that's come online. Uh, we just completed commissioning back in May of 2019. Um, so thus far to date, we've had two operations in May uh, for transmission reduction in that month. Um, it's already recognized over $14,000 in savings for transmission alone, plus a couple hundred dollars in uh, energy arbitrage. Um, we're projecting year one savings of about $140,000 in capacity charges and $150,000 to $170,000 in transmission charges, uh, depending on how we have to spread out that uh, that 3.2 megawatt hours of energy across the peak. Uh, as Sean mentioned, you know, with some of the weather variables, uh, whether you're doing a two-hour discharge, a three-hour discharge, uh, really can affect the economics of these projects going forward. Um, so I talk about uh, an easy site to deal with, a level site. Um, you can see that tree line there essentially just to the right of the chain link fence for the pole yard. Uh, it, it was a flat site um, between a pole yard and a parking lot. Um, just a couple of trees that had to be removed. Um, and so that really led to the ease of construction and the ease of installation on this uh, and really allowed us to get everything basically in in six weeks and less. Uh, and here's a, a couple uh, project complete folders, uh, photos as well as uh, in-process in uh, photos. Uh, you see there in the upper left-hand corner, a uh, 40-foot shipping container with two HVA units up top, uh, the inverter on the right-hand side, and then the two transformers, uh, both station service as well as the step-up transformer uh, located behind that. Um, in the lower left-hand side, you see the concrete piers for the battery container. Uh, in the lower right, you see a, a vault for the inverter as well as uh, a pull box for some of the cable coming into the battery itself. Um, lessons learned on this. Uh, really, one of the things we try to reiterate is uh, leverage economies of scales and really try to leverage um, the benefits of joint action. Um, as I mentioned, MWIC's a joint action agency. Um, we're working with 20 municipal utilities within the Commonwealth. So any way that we can try to you know, band utilities together uh, or do projects uh, that, that are going to represent more than just one is really a win uh, for everybody. Uh, this project uh, used some of the same building blocks as the uh, Ashburnham and Wakefield projects, which came online before that. Um, the inverter on this is the uh, same manufacturer as uh, Wakefield. Uh, essentially, it's about half the size of that. It uses the same battery cell technology. Uh, wh what that means is really you know, some of the engineering work, design work um, that went into one of these projects is going to be applicable to all three. Uh, so where we can cut down, you know, civil design work, electrical design work, um, costs in that regard, uh, to dilute the cost to everybody and really try to drive down the cost of these projects is a big win. Uh, as I mentioned before, too, site selection is key. Uh, consider the ease of interconnection, consider the ease of access for installation of equipment, loading and unloading, uh, and then some of the other variables. Uh, and as Sean mentioned, too, you can really fit these things into pretty small uh, footprints. Uh, the Templeton site alone for the battery, inverter, and two transformers is just 28 by 75. Um, so you can see how it's pretty easy to shoehorn that um, into a relatively small area. Um, and then from an operational standpoint, again, uh, joint action is a key to success. Um, as Sean mentioned back in 2016, they got the battery installed in Sterling, and the question came to MWIC uh, as a wholesale generation entity. Um, how are we going to run this thing? How are we going to you know, operate to really recognize some of the model revenue streams uh, that, Dr., that Dr. Zhuk and his team uh, had put forward? And you know that that left us scratching our heads here at Emwick, uh, but after a little bit of work um, and you know doing a couple analyses of you know historical as well as future trends for uh, load peaking, uh, we were able to come up with a pretty solid methodology uh, for anticipating peak loads and peak hours, uh, and then we're able to spread this out uh, across all the municipalities that we represent um, in Massachusetts. So in addition to operating our 24-hour control room for the wholesale generation assets that we have. Uh, we do control for uh, distributed batteries as well as distributed behind the meter generation as well. Uh, Templeton's one of just five uh, battery storage systems currently controlled by MWIC, uh, and a portion of the 30 megawatts of storage and behind the meter generation uh, that we're currently operating um, for peak load reduction within the Commonwealth. Um, so again, you know, when you're talking about we're operating generation for four different utilities uh, in Massachusetts as opposed to a single one, um, again, diluting those costs. Um, and being able to spread out the cost for you know two or more operators' time across a bunch of utilities really drives home savings for everybody participating. Um, and our outlook for the future is, is nothing but good things. Um, we see the sell price of lithium-ion storage continuing to decline, um, and with Templeton, as I mentioned, coming on without any type of grant funding, 
Uh, we're continuing to try to press this technology with some of the other utilities in Massachusetts that have yet to adopt it. Um, we see RNS transmission costs continuing to rise for the next five to seven years in New England, uh, particularly as Massachusetts tries to bring in more clean energy imports uh, from other parts of New England as well as outside of New England. Um, we see that number continuing to rise. Uh, and energy storage and peak demand management is a really great way uh, to try to you know, mitigate some of these rising costs. Um, additionally, new incentives like the Clean Peak Standard, which has emerged in Massachusetts, uh, drive down the cost of installation even more, uh, even though it's already standalone. Um, and, you know, as we preach this to other people, uh, Templeton, again, still has a bit of an open peak position, so they're considering potential expansion in three to five years. So I think that's it for me. Terrific. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so just a reminder to folks to type in any questions as they come up, and we'll get to them at the end. So now we move on to our third and final presentation. This will be by David Polson from the Wakefield Municipal Gas and Light Department, where he's an engineering and operations manager with 34 years in the electric utility industry. David, thanks for joining us. You may be on mute. We can't hear you yet. Yes, I, I was. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Bill, thank you very much for the uh, the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, CISA for uh, allowing or inviting me to uh, participate in this um, webinar. That's great. Um, as you mentioned, I have 35 years in the utility industry, and you know, just to be exposed to uh, this new utility technology uh, and the application is pretty exciting. And you know, as you can see from some of the other speakers, you know, it's a, a common theme with utility businesses is uh, developing in this area, and I think we can all agree this is a, a very exciting technology. Um, so, you know, some of the things that, uh, just need to move this. So some things I'll talk about today, just the, uh, the project team, an overview of the project, uh, some of the agreements and financing. Uh, project schedule, physical layout, construction equipment, lessons learned, and year-to-date savings. So, just a, a you know a, a thank you to uh, the team. I think the one of the common themes we've heard is that the relationship between the municipal light departments and MWIC, um NEC is a, is a, a key as well. Uh, we were one of the the folks that went out to Sterling to look at that facility before we kind of dove into the battery storage technology and went out to bid and evaluated it. And that was very, very helpful. Understanding uh, what uh, what Sean had done out there, working with NEC, you know, MWORK's involvement, you know, gave us a level of confidence that, in, you know, that uh, this is a, a great venture to go into. So, uh, you know, that was uh, very interesting. And what I think is important for everyone is that you need to understand that you know, even though we're a small area in Massachusetts, you know, we we uh, work collectively together uh, to understand what each of us are doing. You know, it's uh, so many benefits to actually work as a as a team and and, uh, and get a, uh, some insight on, onto some of the the projects that people are working on. Uh, special thanks to the uh, the DOER and uh, Mass CEC for their financial support for the uh, through the ACES grant. You know, we had uh, significant funding for our project, which is helpful. And then our project support, we used a PLM Engineering out of Hopkinton, Powerline Construction from Wilmington, and Hayes Engineer for, uh, Engineering, Engineering from uh, Wakefield. Um, PLM, they did uh, they did the Sterling site, and uh, so they were very familiar with with the construction. And Powerline Construction was relatively new, um, but they did a, a, a nice job as well. It's the first one that they've done. The project overview, this project uh, presented a clear and innovative path to meet the goals of the light department in providing benefits to the Commonwealth. So, you know, we, uh, you know, we're on board with, uh, you know, using this technology, the lithium ion batteries is, uh, as Jason said, prices are going down. Uh, you can fit the size of the batteries are decreasing. You can get more batteries into a, a smaller container. So the total output is greater. Um, the partnership that we have with NEC uh, and uh, and MWIC has been 
I think, the driving force on why the project was completed on time and on budget. And we were able to immediately utilize the significant savings um, through the, the batteries. So once the battery project was finished, we used it uh, to, uh, to meet a peak and, and uh, started to immediately save some, um, some money. Uh, this energy storage system supports leveling out the peak loads, as, as others have talked about. So for us, we're using it as peak shaving, managed cost for capa and capacity, transmission costs, uh, so we can, you know, ultimately you want to, you have to manage those costs, pass them off to the rate payers, but really it avoids escalating uh, costs. Able to respond to real-time pricing. So last year, I mean, our system was not up and running, but the LMPs in the region, you know, during certain situations started to spike. So, you know, having the the ability to uh, to address that that uh, that pricing when it uh, starts to go high is is uh, is key and very helpful. Uh, reduction in the NEMO system load during peak times to drive down congestion, congestion costs in the area, reduce peak shaving, demand to reduce the capacity, again, for the region. So it's, uh, it's not only locally helpful, but in the region it's helpful as well. And manage your cost of energy to the ratepayers. And ultimately, I think um, to highlight this uh, reduces carbon emissions. So we, you know, we're, we charge off hours, but you know the uh, uh, the need for peaking units. Um, you know there should be less and less need with the uh, the implementation and use of uh, battery storage. Uh, project details: We installed a three megawatt hour, three megawatt, five megawatt hour system with a uh, real output of uh, 2.4 and 4.8. That's behind the meter, and it was at one of our substations. The uh, the project started in September. We started to order equipment for it that long lead time. Uh, worked through the winter on ours, and it was completed on January 31st, 2019. Project cost was uh, 3.2 million, and then we had the uh, the, the mass uh, CEC grant, the ACES grant, uh, for a total of uh, um, project cost of around two and a half million. The storage system was was interconnected to provide support for. Uh, Wakefield's distribution system and peak load. So that was our, our focus. The location was at our substation, which is right off the, the 115 kV uh, transmission corridor. So we have two substations, uh, and uh, both are, I have two transmission lines feeding them. Uh, this is on the other side of town. So, the, uh, so again, an ideal location, although it's behind the meter. Summary of this project supports managing electric rates for our customers. Uh, reduces congestion on the transmission system and lowers emissions. Those are our three uh, highlights from the project when we uh, decided to go forward. Financing and agreement. We, we have an excellent relationship with MWIC. MWIC has really helped, I think, us along with some of the other municipals that have, have used MWIC. They, uh, they offered, we were able to uh, take advantage of a um, pooled low pro loan program to secure financing and also uh, implement an operations and management agreements with them so that we can take full um, full availability of the options to uh, to dispatch the charge and dispatch the units they they have staff that can focus on it um, and it's uh, it's worked out well so the financing we uh, we finance a 15-year uh, equipment lease and after 15 years we'll we'll own the Equipment. Uh, we have uh, interconnection agreements with MWIC and operation dispatch and maintenance agreements with them and licensing agreement. The operation agreement with MWIC maintains, so they maintain a state of charge. They charge it up uh, depending on the forecast on when it will be needed. And they pick the time when the uh, charging is the least cost and, and then they take care of discharging it. So um, they've been very effective at managing these and I think it you know they uh, they do multiple light departments, and I think that uh, they do a great job. And I think because they manage uh, multiple uh, light departments, they're able to do it effectively. Uh, our project justification: when we first looked at it, it was based on a 15-year life cycle with a 11-year uh, payback and uh, no grant funding at the time, and and that really uh, didn't fit our model at the time. 
So when the grant funding became available, we uh, we applied for it. Uh, MWOC again was our kind of our partner in that. Um, with the funding, we're looking at an eight-year payback. And then the battery, you know, we we uh, guaranteed projected output of uh, of 10 years. And really, the life cycle, although it's a, you know, it, people are looking at 15 years. You know, the uh, manufacturer is saying that properly maintained batteries, you should get 20 years out of it. So, made the project more viable. Um, provides a direct and measurable financial impact for Wakefield Light, and the te technology provides a positive environmental impact as well. So, those are the uh, the key drivers to our project justification. Project schedule again, just to highlight, we. Uh, Work with NEC um, and and uh, our site contractor, electric contractor, to uh, to meet the schedule. Um, we had uh, an OPM project manager again work closely with with uh, MWORK through the whole process. Um, the team worked very well together with an end goal of meeting the uh, the um, a completion. So we had it in service for February 1st of 2019. Just to give you a, an idea of our site conditions, as, as Jason pointed out earlier, you know these are compact units, so they fit in a relatively small area. Our substation footprint is very small. Um, we we opted to put it here. It took uh, many renditions of a plan to try to figure out the best fit. It was like a puzzle to uh, to locate it within the yard so that it wouldn't be in the way for um, power transformer uh, work, or maintenance, replacement, transmission work. We have the transmission that comes in on the, on the left-hand side, and uh, plus we had um, duct banks in the area, so it's a typical um, substation. So we we found out location that fit perfectly. Uh, really leveraged the uh, the available space we had. We had an, an older uh, a power transformer that was uh, uh, basically a, an old spare that we eliminated the foundation for that, and we and we uh, we put the battery storage in that location. So. We put a 53 by 8 battery storage container, 48 DC racks. Uh, the West Hack inverter is located on the site. Uh, two step-up transformers, uh, 440 volts to 13.8 handhold and uh, auxiliary transformer for house power. Um, and then we tied directly into the substation on, into a spare cubicle we had onto uh, onto the bus. So some of the construction pictures, the pre-construction was. You see the concrete curbing. That was where the other uh, power transformer was stored before. Uh, that area became one of the footings for the uh, the battery storage container, one of two. Um, so you can just see the uh, the contractor working on a not so great weather day and uh, installing one of the uh, the battery foundations. Then we show. Then uh, I have a, a picture of the conduit installation, just going from the uh, the pad mount uh, step up transformers. Uh, over to the uh, the inverter and uh, over to uh, the the uh, uh, switch gear. Then we have uh, the DC cable uh, conduits. So you know one of the things is the uh, all this equipment comes you know and, and is dropped in on a crane. So the contractor that that we use uh, was very diligent about making sure that the conduit. Uh, was in the right location turning up to meet the window of the unit. So you see these conduits for the DC cables that are that are um, turned up. They they have to um, there's just a few inches on either side all around on each of those where the uh, the knockout is for the uh, uh, through the floor of the 53 foot container. So you know it's important that everything gets centered on the foundation and the conduits all line up and lined up and and it was actually a, a perfect installation. So again, everyone did a uh, nice job. The equipment, you know, there's a picture of the West Tech Inverta. On the left, there's a the uh, the AC cables that go over to the the step up transformers. Uh, the picture on the right is a is is our our unit uh, from NEC, 53 foot by eight feet, uh, and the step up transformers are in the back of the yard. You can see those, you know. So the so as uh, our site is is really compact. Um, the AC units were on the roof of the unit, so that did save us a little space because we still have to get a vehicle around that way. Um, so that's uh, it's. I think NEC is even making the the uh, units more compact now. 
Uh, lessons learned, we had material and equipment lead times were uh, an issue when you deal with coming from other countries like the West Tech Inverter comes from Germany, the container came from China, um, so shipping and, you know, and uh, customs, uh, you know, I, it just comes with a set of challenges. So we, we went to the equipment to arrive um, when it was scheduled when, and be installed on a certain date. So just that coordination was, was sometimes challenging. Uh, the uh, the contractors had to work closely together to find out where the equipment was, and I think one of the the, the causes of maybe some shifting um, that caused a little anxiety was was delivery of material from outside the country. I think that was a challenge. So you know we talked about how to do that. We we did uh, the material was was scheduled to be delivered, and and it really needs to be put in a laydown area first, and then the crane hired to uh, to set the equipment. Um, versus just in time delivery where it shows up and all the equipment is there very it was a little frustrating but we got through it and it uh, it worked out great um, integration of site contractors and equipment providers so our site contractor did the civil and electrical work interconnection and our our equipment provider was NEC who provided all the equipment uh, it's critical that both uh, work closely together with the uh, um, with the owner of the project which was us and MWIC. Shipping, delivery, installation, you know, it's uh, really, again, um, coordination effort to try to make things go very smooth. And the uh, the actual battery installation, the batteries are delivered uh, separately from the container because of the weight. And, and that uh, a battery rack weighs 2,500 pounds, has to be offloaded, um, brought over with a skid steer or some uh, piece of equipment over to the container over uh, crushed stone on the gravel, uh, crushed stone in the yard, and and uh, if that tips over or falls, and you know there's a um, high cost to replace it, and never mind delays in the project. So yeah, battery installation was important. Uh, communications, you know that's uh, that's that's critical. You you definitely we we did not leave that to the end, um, but it takes time to make sure you have a good solid communication system because that's what. Um, NEC communicates to the battery system to make sure it's it's running. If there's do some troubleshooting, update of software, uh, running the batteries remotely if they need to do something. Uh, MWIC is is uh, monitors our batteries, charges, discharges our battery system. They need communication. You know you need to have a good communication network that is reliable, and and uh, and both companies or both parties have access to. Never mind in ourselves. So we. Uh, battery system supplier and overview training. Uh, you know, you going through the process. You, you know, we thought we knew uh, a lot about the battery system, but uh, it was more of an overview. What we when we really learned a little bit more about it was when the uh, the NEC came in, did a more comprehensive training, and uh, for both the the operation of the system and the software, and that I think would have been helpful for us if that was done earlier in the project instead of later that would have then we I think we would have looked at things a little differently but either way um, you know probably more detailed information up front and then control software for the uh, battery energy storage they use a um, aero software uh, that controls it and and then how to integrate some of those that functionality into our SCADA system for alarm so that we can monitor because we you know we manage the system so if there's a, an alarm that comes in, we want to know about it as well, um, and, and monitor the operation, monitor the output. So we're uh, we tied that into our, our SCADA system, and you know we used a the PLM uh, com engineering company that also um, did work at Sterling and some other municipals, and they uh, uh, they were familiar with what needed to be done. They they fortunately we had uh, good design drawings good specs that were uh, very solid. So we didn't have any any issues, um, well, very minor. And, and in turn, uh, no change orders to speak of, nothing substantial, a couple minor ones. But overall, I think it's important to make sure that the uh, the engineering firm uh, is very familiar with what needs to be done. The, you know, the, uh, the equipment is unique and not everyone has an understanding. And I think that comes from experience. So we're fortunate enough 
to have uh, uh, someone had worked out the bugs and, and other jobs, and we were uh, we were lucky. Also, we were fortunate that one of the other municipals, Ashbraham, installed the same system as as we did, same equipment, uh, same engineering firm, and we were able to go up and look at what was done on their site, look at how the equipment was installed, look at the challenges they had, and we were able to make modifications as well. So it was extremely helpful. Our year-to-date savings, so we, we just, uh, the unit just started to run on February 1st. They became available. So we ran February, March, April, May. Uh, we hit all the peaks so far. Uh, run time and, and uh, how many times it runs is it ran three times to hit the, the peak in February to April was five. Um, and you can see what our uh, megawatt output at the peak was. You know, MWORK has done a great job with, with looking at the peak and discharging appropriately so we capture that with the uh, the highest output you know you can you can uh, make the window larger or and but you spread out your output for the battery so if you tighten that up then uh, and you hit it you hit it with a uh, higher capacity and I turn in turn you uh, you really get some benefit from that so year-to-date savings so far is eighty seven thousand um, dollars eighty eight thousand actually with the arbitrage, and we're uh, forecasted to run on June 17th, um, and we're estimating that we'll probably, if we hit that peak, which we which we will, uh, that our our six month savings will be um, $113,000 approximately. So we're uh, very happy with that. On the technology, that the 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 systems have worked out great. The partnership we have with everyone has been fantastic. Um, the state support. I can't say much, enough about how everyone is focused on on uh, projects like this. Uh, we'll do reporting back to the state so they can capture the, the information as well. But it uh, is very successful. We're very pleased with it, and our um, you know our board supports it. Our board approved it, and our uh, you know so our light board. So I think overall it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, and that's it for uh, me. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. All right. So we have lots of questions that have come in, and I have tried to group them into some broad categories. And in general, these are for the three panelists. Some are specific to one of the panelists, so I'll, I'll let you know if there's a question specifically directed to one of you, but any of you, feel free to answer. All right, so first let's move on to questions about the technology itself. We had a couple of questions about the lifespan of the lithium ion battery systems. How um, Some of you mentioned a lifespan, I think, of about eight years, and I think, David, you in particular, you mentioned a 20-year lifespan. So if any of you would like to comment on what is the expected lifespan of a lithium ion energy storage? And then, David, you in particular, how did you project a 20-year lifespan? Are there any particular management techniques that you've put in place? Yeah, uh, I mean, for us, when we uh, originally we, we looked at 15 and then we've been talking to NEC, um, NEC really can't give a... Uh, you know, through experience, they can't say it'll be 20 years because the, the application of the technology hasn't been there. But uh, through proper maintenance and um, limited discharge unnecessarily, um, maintaining proper state of charge, there's, uh, the, there's NEC feel, felt, at least they explained to us, that we should be able to get 20 years out of the, uh, out of the batteries. So, so I think that's a little bit longer than expected, but that's, that's what they... Um, have talked to us about. Thanks. Would anyone yeah, else like to that, comment on that? Go ahead. Uh, Sam, uh, our, my comment on that was that we looked at a 10 year, we're covered for warranty and everything out to 10 years. I have to attend in, um, Dr. Juk's uh, IP review every year and seeing the technology advancements of technology. I firmly believe in about 10 years you'll be able to double your capacity in the same footprint. I think we'd want to change them out to, to fill it to have additional capacity. I, I firmly believe that's going to be the future. Yeah, uh, this is Imre Duke. Uh, I think 20 years is, shall we say, 
extremely optimistic. Uh, you would hardly have anyone except a battery vendor suggest 20 years. In general, people would be expecting eight to 10 years, and then with a change out in batteries, uh, you can go another 10 years. Right. Thank you. Well, let's uh, let's talk about uh, that. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to mention. You want to add to that? Is, sure. Yeah. Um, that that ex life expectation for batteries has a lot to do with how they are used, and I think everybody is probably familiar with this from your car battery or your flashlight or your uh, laptop or what have you. If you are cycling it you know many times a day and and deep cycling it you're going to get a uh, you know a shorter lifespan than if you are using it judiciously and um, keep you know not not deep discharging every time you cycle it and different battery chemistries like to be used in different ways so it really a lot of this is um, is highly dependent on what you're doing with the battery and how you're doing it. So in the case of some of these um, municipal projects, if you're really cycling it, you know, maybe a couple times a month because you're just trying to hit a monthly peak, uh, that's a pretty light use as compared to some other commercial project, for example, where you might be cycling it daily. So it really is going to depend and, and um, not to, you know, complicate matters, but I think it just worth, it, it's worth saying that um, that different projects may have different chemistries and they may have very different operational uh, characteristics and those are going to add up to, you know, different, different lifespans. Great, thanks for that, Todd. I'm going to lump three questions together, um, picking up on battery life so is there what does the coal do to battery lifespan or battery capacity is there any loss and is there anything that you do to keep them warm and how and related to that someone asked a question about the the battery placement what the containers are, are they just generally use shipping containers and then the third question I will put out there is, where is the inverter housed? I believe one of you, Jason, I believe you mentioned the inverter is in a vault, and there was a question as to why. So three battery infrastructure questions for you. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, with regards to the temperature thing, um, all, all of these containers are fully climate controlled. Um, so they have both heating in the winter time as well as uh, air conditioning in the summertime uh, to, to really keep the, the batteries at, at a proper operating temperature uh, and avoid some of the thermal issues associated with discharge, uh, particularly in the summertime uh, when you're running a deep discharge on these things for a, like a summer capacity peak. Uh, you, you tend to get quite a lot of heat built up in there. Um, so again, air conditioning to take that out and then you know heating in the winter time uh, to, to try to keep temperature stable. Um, so from a temperature management standpoint, there's not a whole lot of variability in there. Um, but, but to Sean's point, um, that, that the station service cost associated with running that stuff uh, is something that, you know, in developing any project, um, you really need to be aware of um, because, you know, there's going to be a, a constant draw to keep some of these, you know, components in there fully energized and ready to dispatch at a moment's notice. And then there's going to be the constant draw for the heating and AC uh, in the project year round. Um, and, and then with regards to the inverter foundation, the inverter itself is actually, uh, it's mounted above ground, um, but we have a DC vault um, that extends about four feet below ground. Um, you saw in some of the pictures from David, uh, conduits stub up, come into the middle of the container, uh, and then that DC cabling goes underground uh, to a vault before it pops back up into the uh, inverter itself. Uh, and then from there again, back underground, uh, the AC cabling out to the step up transformers and then to the distribution system. Anybody else have a, a comment for that set of questions? I think Jason yeah, the only comment is the obvious one. 
that uh, depending on your environmental temperature, uh, you're going to have a fair amount of parasitic losses for air conditioning and uh, uh, cooling and heating. And if you don't do that well, then you lose in uh, efficiency uh, of the unit and also it ages faster. Okay, thank you. Well, let's move on to some questions about revenue streams, cost savings, and financing these projects. First, a clarifying question, Sean, for you, over what period of time were your one million savings? And is that in gross savings or net of infrastructure costs? In gross savings, that was from December 2016 to May of this year. To actually, April, May 1st of this year, I should say. All right, great. And now for any of you, who decides when the battery should be uh, dispatched and who deploys it and which of your systems are manually dispatched? If any. For, for Wakefield, um, we have a relationship with MWIC. So MWIC, MWIC watches for the, uh, the peak period when it's forecasted. And they, uh, they send out um, a seven-day forecast in advance to, uh, uh, to us or uh, to other municipals as well. Uh, so they look at the, the forecasted load. And, and then the day of, uh, they will send out other notifications as well to tell us that it looks like a um, this will be a peak day, and, and then in turn, they, they to keep us informed, and then they narrow it down to that peak uh, hour. Our, it's really almost two hours, and they'll, uh, they'll dispatch the units. So they, they keep us informed every day along the way, right up uh, two or three correspondence uh, just prior to the, the, uh, the, uh, the discharge of the batteries. Uh, so MWIC, we, and we've given MWIC that control for us so that they... Uh, they can ensure that they meet the peak. And I think that's one of the nice Anyone things else? about collaboration on some of these projects as well, uh, as you know, D David alluded to, and um, you know, as Emwick has been doing for Templeton, uh, Wakefield, Ashburnham, and West Boylston, um, you know, because we're able to aggregate and you know, essentially have a single dispatch center controlling multiple units, uh, that that really takes the weight off uh, of the municipal utilities and allows them to avoid doing some of the manual dispatching uh, and control themselves, uh, particularly when some of these utilities are relatively small with, you know, smaller staff. It, 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 you know, it certainly yeah. pays to try to do things together. Yeah, Sterling did very nicely for uh, the better part of a year, uh, but having it done by professionals at MWIC uh, is uh, a considerable convenience. I'll agree with that 100%. <laughs> Great. Okay. Another question for all of you. I know we where this might be the the last question. Um, do you, any of you participate in any of the ISO New England's ancillary service markets, and can you participate in forward capacity markets? Uh, we killed the night. So, so I think ahead, I heard John. Wakefield Wakefield does not. Sterling does not. Uh, T Templeton does not either. Um, and it, it really kind of goes back to the the revenue streams Dr. Juk was talking about earlier. Um, and that, you know, essentially being inside the ISO markets uh, precludes, you know, these assets from participating in some of the behind the meter load reductions. Um, and, you know, what we've seen, you know, in, in some of this, you know, modeling really proved out is that the biggest bang for your buck uh, comes from load reduction as opposed to participation in the ISO markets. Um, you know, should that change in the future, obviously, um, you know, we'd go through the process of registering the assets and, you know, trying to change up the use case where applicable. Um, but right now, at least in New England, uh, behind the meter load reductions where it's at. Yeah, we have to remember that much of the regulatory structure uh, is in flux because of the changing technologies. Okay. 
And I would add to that, <coughs> FERC, the, the, the federal uh, commission that regulates mark these markets um, in the ISO and RTO territories, fairly recently issued an order that um, ISOs need to open the, their markets, their wholesale energy markets to energy storage and also take into account the operational, uh, uh, I would say, you know, un unique operational characteristics of storage. That's kind of um, in progress in various areas around the country to, to more or less degree, so greater or lesser degree. So um, some of these, these markets may be changing as we speak in terms of their rules for participation and so uh, it it may be that a year or two from now it'll be a very different um, s scenario but um, bottom line is as as somebody said um, really the the cost of capacity is what's driving these projects in ISO New England right now and for the foreseeable future. Thank you Todd and yes we received a Several questions about energy storage participation in market, markets, but unfortunately we have reached the end of our webinar time. The good news is there will be more webinars on energy storage in the future months, so please keep an eye on CISA's website. In particular, we're talking with other municipal utilities across the U.S. to get their perspectives and their experience on their pilot and demonstration projects. Uh, Sam has put up some other upcoming storage webinars on your, so you should see them on your screen. And as always, you should feel free to reach out to us at CISA if you have any questions. So with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists for your excellent presentations and to all our guests, especially those of you who submitted interesting questions. Thanks and have a great day.